Hey everybody, Chris McClure here. We're going to now talk about finding real zeros of polynomials functions by looking at uh, several techniques of locating those zeros, meaning finding values of the independent variable, usually x, which will make the polynomial equal to zero. That's what we're looking at. Um, and in case you're wondering about complex zeros, well, we'll talk about those in the next section. So set that uh, concern about uh, factorizing completely aside because not every polynomial can you factor completely as a product of linear factors. But we'll take a look at finding real zeros wherever they do exist. First thing that we're going to look at here is the remainder and factor theorems. Well, here's the first thing, and it's pretty straightforward. This basically says is that you can um, take a look at dividing one polynomial F by some other polynomial G, and the result will be in the form of this quotient which is yet another polynomial plus some remainder written to be divided by this divisor G. So in other words, you could write that polynomial F that you divide it as a product of the quotient times the divisor plus the remainder. And remember, the remainder is always going to be a polynomial that is smaller degree compared to the, um, the, the dividend. And the remainder theorem basically says this, that let f be a polynomial function if f of x is divided by this linear factor of x minus c. E. So where c is a number, then the remainder is f of c. And that's pretty easy to prove. And if you're interested in the proof, it's in the textbook. So what if we were to ask the question, is x plus 2? a factor of x cubed plus 3x squared plus 2x minus 1. Well, then what you would do is rewrite x plus 2 as x minus negative 2, and then take f of negative 2 and see what you get. And f of negative 2, replacing x by negative 2, yeah, the result is negative 1. And because of the fact that f of negative 2 is negative 1, that means that x plus 2 is not a factor of this polynomial because the remainder is negative 1. By the way, it would be a factor if the remainder was 0. Now, what about what would be the remainder of dividing by x minus 1? If you were to take this polynomial divided by x minus 1, what would you get? Well, just take f of 1, and the result is 5. So, and of course, that would mean that that uh, x minus 1 is also not a factor of that polynomial. Because if x minus 1 was a factor, then the remainder would be 0. So that's what we're saying here for the factor theorem, is that if you want to find out whether x minus c is a factor of your polynomial, then just take f of c. And if f of c is equal to 0, that's the same thing as saying that x minus c is a factor of the polynomial. So the, the factor theorem basically has two parts. It's an if and only if statement. The first part is if f of c is equal to 0, then x minus c is a factor of the polynomial. And then the uh, converse of that, if x minus c is a factor of f of x, then f of c is equal to 0. So again, we go back to the question, is x plus 1 a factor of this polynomial? Well, take f of negative 1, and what do you get? f of negative 1, in this case, works out to be 0. And because f of negative 1 is 0, that means that x minus negative 1, which is the same as x plus 1, is a factor of this polynomial. Kind of handy to know, huh? How about x minus 1? Is x minus 1 a factor of this polynomial? Well, I'll take f of 1. f of 1 
is equal to 4, turns out. And because f of 1 is not equal to 0, that means x minus 1 is not a factor of the polynomial. So if you know the degree of your polynomial, you can at least have an upper limit as to the number of real zeros that exist for that polynomial. And that upper limit is established by the degree. So if you have a fifth degree polynomial, then there will be no more than five real zeros. If you have a seventh degree polynomial, polynomial then there are no more than seven real zeros, etc. So we're on the hunt for zeros. We've got some high degree polynomial. We're trying to find the zeros of it. Why? Well, it could be that we want to factor it. Or we just want to solve a polynomial equation. But in our hunt for zeros, we uh, could hunt around by, you know, plugging in some different random values for. Uh, x to see if f of x is equal to 0. But we could actually narrow our search just by looking at the rational zeros theorem. So suppose that you've got this polynomial here, and of course we've got it in a very generic form. a sub 0 is the constant term, the 0 degree term, and a sub n is going to be the leading term. Now, Basically, what the rational theor uh, zeros theorem basically says is that if this polynomial has a zero in the form of a, like an integer or some fraction, in other words, a rational number, which you could write as a you know, fraction of two numbers, even if q is one or some other integer. So if, if you have a rational zero, p over q, in lowest terms, then p would be a factor of a sub 0, and q would be a factor of a sub n. So how we use the rational zeros theorem is basically narrow down our uh, list of possible candidates of real zeros. If, you, if you're looking for rational zeros, of course we can have real zeros that are irrational as well, but uh, if you're looking for rational zeros, then here's what we do. Here's an example here. We've got this polynomial and we want to, you know, look for any rational zeros. So basically what you do is you take this trailing term, this constant, negative 12, and you look, also take a look at the, the 3 here, the, the leading coefficient. And you look at all the possible ways that you can form fractions between factors of the negative 12 and the factors of the 3. Okay? And then you'll just form that list of fractions, of all possible fractions. So here's, here's P. P is basically going to be the numerator of the little potential rational function. So it, we're talking about all possible factors of negative 12. And here they are. We've listed them all. And now let's take a look at all factors of 3. Well, that's easy, plus or minus 1 and plus or minus 3. And then we go through and list all the possible ways that we can form a, a fraction involving a factor from this list here in the numerator and a number from the Q list in the denominator. And here is that list of all possible fractions that you can form. So what we're saying here now is that if this polynomial here has any rational zeros, that any and all rational zero fa uh, zeros of this function here will come from this list. It will be one of these. If you have a rational zero of that, of that polynomial, it's in this list. Any, all, any and all rational zeros are found in this list. 
find the real zeros of a polynomial function. So let's start putting together stuff that we've uh, uncovered so far. So we've got 3x cubed plus 8x squared minus 7x minus 12. What are the zeros of this function? So first of all, this is a third degree polynomial, so we know that there will be at most three real zeros. Could be zero, could be one, could be two, could be three. And in fact, it's impossible for there to be no real zeros. As you'll see here in a few minutes, all odd degree polynomials will have at least one real zero. And let's go ahead and read step two. The polynomial has integer coefficients. Use the rational zeros theorem to basically come up with a laundry list of potential rational zeros. So that's what we're going to do here. In fact, we did that on the previous slide. So there is that list of possible rational zeros. And then the next step is for you to go through and start uh, doing synthetic division. Or you could use the remainder theorem and evaluate the function uh, with these number. Of course, you want to start off with the smallest, simplest numbers first. So, like I said, you could do the synthetic division, you know, divide by x minus negative 1. And it turns out that you have a zero remainder. So that means that negative 1 is a zero because f of negative 1 is zero. So, remainder is zero. Or instead of doing um, any division like you see here, you could just start taking f of each of these numbers starting from smallest to largest and up into these fractions here and start seeing where you get f of being equal to zero. Either way, you could do the synthetic division or just evaluating the function to see where you get zero. But, hey, now we've just discovered that negative one is a solution which means that x plus 1 is a factor and how do you know that this polynomial right here the 3x squared plus 5x minus 12 is the other factor well just by looking at these numbers down here the 3x squared plus 5x minus 12 is going to be the quotient of the division of this 3x cubed plus 8x squared minus 7x minus 12 divided by uh, the x minus negative 1. So that's why we can factorize this polynomial as the product of these. And then let's go ahead and see if we can factor this polynomial, which, hey, we've got lots of experience now in factorizing second degree polynomial. So you, you know, you can factor using the AC method or by using the quadratic formula or whatever. But it turns out that you can just simply factor using probably the AC method. So x plus 3 times 3x minus 4 turns out to be the factors of the second degree polynomial. So your this third degree polynomial here factors completely as the product of these three linear factors. The hard part was just doing this initial um, identification of negative 1 as a 0. But notice that negative 3 is also a 0, which appears right there. And also, uh, 4 thirds is another 0. How come? Well, if you set this whole thing right here equal to 0 and solve for x, you'd see that x equals 4 thirds is one solution. So, And you see a 4 thirds right there. So all the rational zeros appear in this list. We just happen to identify one of them and use that as leverage to find the other two zeros by doing this division and factorization and stuff. So what are the zeros? It's going to be negative 1, negative 3, and 4 thirds. Those are your three real zeros. All right, this right here is going to summarize what we just did. We identified the maximum number of real zeros by looking at the degree of the polynomial. If the polynomial has integer coefficients, then use the rational zeros theorem to identify those rational 
numbers that potentially could be zeros. Use substitution, synthetic division, or long division to your work your way through that list to see if you can find a real zero and then you'll be able to do an initial factorization and then add e and then you'll have a polynomial that is the uh, quotient which is going to be one degree less than the original polynomial then you go through the same process and try to factor that as well so you could have a seventh degree polynomial you can find as a real zero which will then will give you a sixth degree polynomial quotient and then you'll go through the same process at each step trying to uh, peel off real factors until you uh, are essentially going to have a whole bunch of linear factors together with maybe some irreducible quadratic factors. So here, here's another example here. f of x is equal to 2 times x to the 4th plus 13x cubed plus 29x squared plus 27x plus 9. So it's uh, get, getting to be a larger polynomial. So we'll go through and use the sequence of steps that we've identified so far. Now notice that this is a fourth degree polynomial so that we know that there are at most four real zeros. And then we can use the rational zeros theorem because of the fact that we've got a polynomial with integer coefficients. And then, so we go through, like we've seen already, how to form all the possible rational zeros of the polynomial. And here's that laundry list right here. And then you just start either doing synthetic division or evaluation of the function at each of these potentials until you find that you've found a number that gives you a zero remainder, which in this case happens to be negative 1. So that means that you know that x plus 1 is a linear factor and with a remainder, not a remainder, but a, a quotient of 2 x cubed plus 11 x squared plus 18 x plus 9. All right, and then you just kind of iterate now and repeat the process for this third degree polynomial. And so you go through and pick a, one of these numbers to try. And in fact, we can even try negative 1 again and to see if negative 1 is a 0 for this polynomial here. And it turns out to be is zero because you get a remainder of zero in this case so it actually turns out that negative one is a uh, is a real zero with multiplicity of at least two and we have a quotient of 2x squared plus 9x plus 9 so this is what we've got so far as far as our factorization goes and then we try to factor this polynomial here and it turns out that you can factor this polynomial like this as x plus 3 times 2x plus 3. So here's what we have for the factorization of this polynomial. Of course, when you set that equal to 0, you get negative 1, you get negative 3, and you get negative 3 halves as three real zeros. And negative 1, of course, has multiplicity 2. So when we talk about solving polynomial equations, it really means go through the process that we just talked about of finding the real zeros of this polynomial here. And those real zeros will be the solutions to this sort of equation where you have zero on the right hand side. So taking that previous polynomial set it equal to zero, we factorized it and uh, that means that we set each of the factors equal to zero and solve for x. And we have these three real solutions. Okay, moving along here. Here's a couple of things to keep in mind. These are theorems. Uh, first, 
that, that every polynomial function with real coefficients can be uniquely factored into a product of linear factors and or irreducible prime quadratic factors. So I don't care if you have a 38 degree polynomial or 175 degree polynomial or whatever. It may be difficult, but you could at least theoretically factor every polynomial as a product of either linear and also quadratic factors. And also, like I alluded to before, every polynomial function of odd degree that has real coefficients has at least one real zero. Remember that the graph of an odd degree polynomial will go from the either the lower left to the upper right or upper left to the lower right. So that means that the graph of an odd degree polynomial has to cross the x-axis at least once. Let's talk about bounds because using bounds will be useful especially in conjunction with your rational zeros theorem. Now when we say that m is some number is a bound that means that all of your real zeros will be within the interval from negative m to positive m. So if I say that 7 is a bound, that means that all the real zeros of your polynomial will be on the interval from negative 7 to positive 7. Now here's this theorem regarding the bounds on the zeros. It's a little bit complicated at least at first until you've done a couple of examples and then it turns out to be a piece of cake. So here's how this bounds on zeros goes. Suppose that this is your polynomial. Now keep in mind that this only works if your polynomial has a leading coefficient of 1. So if your polynomial doesn't have a leading coefficient of 1, it's some other rational number or real number, then factor that number out from the whole polynomial. And you'll see an example here in a minute. Now, so suppose that your polynomial is in this form right here. Now, what we're saying here is that a bound on the zeros of f of this function here, the bound on the zeros of this function is the smaller of the two numbers. And here's where it looks complicated. Either the maximum of, of 1 or the sum of all of the absolute values of the coefficients except for the one leading coefficient, or one plus the maximum of the absolute values of all the leading coefficients, or the absolute values thereof, except for the leading coefficient. Okay, so I'm moving along here. Let's use that theorem to find the bounds on the real zeros for each of these polynomials, starting off with this one right here. So, the leading coefficient is 1, and let's take a look at the maximum of either 1 or the sum of the absolute values of the coefficients except for the, the leading coefficient of 1. So, you can go through and take your 5 plus your 9 plus your 3, which works out to be 17. So the maximum of 1 or 17 is 17. So that's one number for us to look at. Then we'll take a look at 1 plus the maximum of the absolute values of those coefficients. So and the maximum of these coefficients right here, at least for the magnitudes, is, is the 9 there. So 1 plus 9 is 10. So then take the smaller of these two numbers, which is 10. So what we know is that whatever the real numbers are, which are uh, the real zeros for this polynomial, which we don't know right now, but we can I can predict right now with 
certainty is that all of those real zeros of this polynomial will lie between negative 10 and positive 10. Now let's take a look at this polynomial right here. Notice that for part B that this polynomial has a leading coefficient of 4, not 1. So what you do is just factor out the 4, and when you factor out the 4, then here's what you've got right here. And then the, you use the that uh, bounds theorem just on this polynomial within the parentheses. Remember, this polynomial in the parentheses is just basically where you've taking each of these coefficients from the original polynomial and divide it by 4. So now you have this, coef this, this polynomial with, with a leading coefficient of 1. So now let's go ahead and use that balance there. Uh, so first of all, the first part, take the maximum of either 1 or the sum of the uh, absolute values of the coefficients except for the leading. So, so you're going to take your 1 fourth plus 1 half plus 1 half, which is five-fourths. So the maximum of one and five-fourths is five-fourths. So that's one of the two numbers you have to look at. The other number that you have to look at is one plus the maximum of the absolute values of those coefficients. So you got one-fourth, one-half, one-half, so the maximum of these is one-half. So 1 plus a half is 3 halves. And then take the smaller of these two numbers, which is 5 fourths. So 5 fourths is the bound, meaning every real uh, factor, sorry, every real zero of this polynomial, every real zero will be greater than or equal to negative 4, but less than or equal to 5 fourths. So let's say that again. Every real factor of g here will be greater than or equal to 5 fourths, but less than or equal to 5 fourths. So between negative 5 fourths and positive 5 fourths. Sorry, I was just getting distracted. Someone knocked on my door here. I'll be with you in a few minutes. All right, moving along here. Talk about the intermediate value theorem. Intermediate value theorem is a property of continuous functions. And the, the polynomial is certainly nice and continuous, meaning its graph is nice and smooth. There aren't any jumps or holes or anything. So this basically says is that suppose that you've got two numbers on the x-axis, like you got x equals a and x equals b, where a and b are two real numbers. And suppose it works out that f of a is negative and f of b is positive, or vice versa then it turns out that there's going to be some uh, value of x for which f of x is equal to zero, where x would be between a and b. So here's kind of a picture of what we talked about here. So here's your a, here's your b, and f of a is negative in this case, and f of b is positive in this case. It could be vice versa. It could be that f of a is positive and f of b is negative. But as long as f of a and f of b are of opposite signs, then we're guaranteed that there's at least one location. It could be two or three, but at least one location for which the function has a zero. We're guaranteed that. Now, how does that help us? Well, it could be that we've gone through and exhausted our search for rational zeros. And suppose that we're left with a third or higher degree uh, polynomial factor that we still have to try to find real zeros of. And, you know, we're guaranteed that, you know, a, a third degree or fifth degree or an odd degree polynomial is going to have a real zero. So, uh, if you have a third degree polynomial and that you can't find any rational zeros of it, you could at least have some hope of at least approximating the real zero by using this technique. So 
Suppose that you know on the interval from A to B that the function changes signs. So what you could do is you could just chop this interval between A and B up into a bunch of smaller subintervals and evaluate your function at those endpoints of the subintervals. Like for example, if your uh, function changes value, or sorry, changes sign between negative 1 and negative 2, then you can split up the interval, interval from negative 1 to negative 2 in a bunch of, you know, one-tenth length intervals, like negative 1.1, negative 1.2, and so forth, and evaluate your function at each of those intermediate values to see where the function changes sign, and then repeat the process. So here, here's kind of an example to illustrate what we talked about here. So show that this function, this x to the fifth minus x cubed minus 1, show that this polynomial has a 0 between 1 and 2. So we know that f of 1 is a negative number and f of 2 is a positive number. So that we, we know by the intermediate value theorem that there's going to be at least one zero between x equals 1 and x equals 2. So what we'll do is we'll chop up the interval from 1 to 2 into, into 10 subintervals. So maybe like 10 equal subintervals, like 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, and so forth. And then we just start evaluating the function at each of those, you know, intermediate values for uh, for the function. So f of 1.1 is still a negative number, f of 1.2 is still a negative, but then you go to f of 1.3, that's the positive number so that we know that the zero is going to be between 1.2 and 1.3. So then you repeat the process on the interval from 1.2 and 1.3 and then to start evaluating f of 1.2, f of 1.21, f of 1.22, f of 1.23, and f of 1.24. And notice that between f of 1.23 and f of 1.24 that 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 the this function changes sign. So we know that the real zero is somewhere going to be between 1.23 and 1.24. And look, we can get as many decimal places of precision as you want. You want three decimal places of precision for your estimate of the zero, then you can just repeat this process again and start taking a look at f of 1.230, f of 1.231, 2, 3, 4, and so forth to look see where the sign changes. And that'll tell you what the approximate. But what right now I could tell you that because a 0.025 is closer to zero than 0.045, that that the zero will be closer to 1.24 than 1.23. So I would say 1.24 is the, the approximate value of the zero. And indeed, if you were to use the graphing calculator to graph the polynomial, you can actually use the zero function in your calculate menu. And it turns out that that real zero is at x equals 1.23650057, approximately. So 1.24 was a good approximation just by using the calculator to evaluate our function at a bunch of different places in a systematic manner by using the intermediate value theorem. All right, there's one more little topic that we didn't talk about in this slideshow, but they talk about in the textbook, and it's called Descartes' Rule of Signs. Now, I want you to read about it because you're going to be asked some questions uh, on the homework about it, but the Rule of Signs that basically says is that, you know, if you go through your polynomial and you you count the number of times that your coefficient changes signs and then take f of negative x and do the same thing then that should at least inform you as to the the, the number of positive uh, zeros and negative zeros or minus 2 or minus 4 or minus some uh, even number of 
positive or negative zero. So take a look at Descartes rule of signs. And it's a little bit useful, but it's not a big topic in the discussion of uh, finding real zeros of polynomials, but it can come in handy from time to time. So read up on it. But our next section, which is the last section of chapter five, is going to be on finding complex roots of polynomials. So we'll get back to you on the next section here. So take care and we'll see you in the next section.